Right. Uh, now that everyone is here, uh, welcome. Uh, and I must apologize uh, because I have another meeting uh, in the legislative yuan in our parliament, and I will have to leave uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, so that leaves us with uh, less than half an hour. Uh, so I will be uh, very brief in my greetings uh, and just briefly speak about the new ministry as of uh, today, Amon Saud, uh, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, uh, which is the uh, ministry newly charged uh, to build digital resilience uh, for all. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, that's our logo, uh, MODA, uh, and uh, by resilience, uh, we mean like not just surviving, but thriving uh, through the pandemic. To just like we have built uh, the Central Epidemic Command Center mechanism and the digital way to counter pandemic, uh, thanks to our experience in SARS back in 2003, uh, we treat every challenge, every disaster, uh, crisis as uh, a way to make sure that each and every one in our citizenry understands uh, how to overcome future similar challenges and also build capabilities in all our sectors. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, these five fields used to be in different ministries, uh, and they are telcos, uh, the information industry, cybersecurity, uh, internet uh, governance, as well as communications affairs. Uh, but now, instead of belonging to four or five uh, different ministries, they are now all under MODA. Uh, and so MODA is now responsible for a kind of fusional approach uh, to while uh, we're of course enhancing our resilience on cybersecurity, for example, but it, it, it itself is, is a viable industry uh, for the international people, uh, customers, and so on. And while we were uh, pushing the latest innovation in the internet era, uh, for example, Web3 and so on, that also feeds back uh, to the digital transformation of our small and medium enterprises and so on. So all these are now related and all under mode. Next slide, please. So uh, resilience um, can mean many different things to many different people. Uh, and in MODA, uh, we have the MODA proper, uh, the six departments in charge of social development, uh, as in making sure that uh, everyone can enjoy broadband as a human right, digital competence, capabilities, not just literacy, and so on. So to popularize this idea of democratic resilience, that's the MODA proper's job. Uh, but we also have two administrations under MODA. Uh, the administration for digital industries is for industrial development, and the administration for cybersecurity is for response on the cybersecurity emergencies and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, you can find information in our English website, moda.gov.tw, so I will not uh, spend uh, time on the organizational chart. But suffice it to say uh, that we have the help from not just within the public sector, but also the bridges toward the private sector. For example, the Institute for Information Industry, III, a very important bridge to the private sector, is now helping the administration for digital industries. The Telecom Technology Center now builds trustworthy technology, for example, privacy enhancing technology to enable free flow of data with trust. The TW NIC, of course, a key player uh, of the .tw domain name in internet uh, governance, and they are our subordinate uh, agencies, bridges to the private sector and to the community. Uh, this year, at uh, the end of the year, we'll establish a new non-departmental public body called the NICE, the National Institute for Cybersecurity, to help us on the technical parts uh, of our cybersecurity resilience and development. Next slide. Um, and so uh, here uh, is, I think, the highest uh, concentration of digital related talents, but still uh, in the public sector due to our examination and salary structure, there are still, for example, cybersecurity experts uh, that are not easily finding their way into the employment in the previous ministries. Uh, because, frankly speaking, uh, the private sector pays triple the salary <laughs> to retain cybersecurity talents. Uh, but uh, in MODA, uh, as well as in the NICE, at the end of the year, the National Institute, uh, we work uh, to have a much more flexible uh, payment structure. Uh, and even though uh, someone may not have a PhD or a master's degree at Loma, because in cybersecurity, uh, many people engage startup very quickly. I'm a high school dropout myself, dropped out of the middle high, right? So even for people like me, 
uh, if we have uh, good uh, like DEFCON CPF or CVEs or uh, the in the field uh, examples, badges, certifications, and so on, uh, for the first time, our public sector is offering the same salary as, say, PhD. Uh, diploma, so they're now uh, interchangeable. So for the first time, we can do some talent circulation uh, with the private sector, with the establishment of MoDA. So that's like my five minutes uh, presentation, and I welcome any and all questions. Yes. So um, by order of raising hand, maybe request. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for doing this. Yeah. Um, congrats on setting up the ministry. I know sure. it's recent. Um, mm -hmm. So my question is about Taiwan's efforts to do uh, low Earth orbit satellites mm. uh, for use in the event of uh, mm -hmm. some sort of attack from yeah. uh, China. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that effort? And specifically, have you been in touch with mm -hmm. Starlink, SpaceX, and Elon Musk about this? There's some concern in the US that like Elon Musk is heavily involved in Chinese business activities and has its presence there. Uh, is that on the table? You didn't work with Thank you. Uh, so we have allocated uh, the budget uh, for the next couple of years to build uh, 700, uh, we call it non-geostationary, so not necessarily low, maybe also mid uh, Earth orbit uh, that will enable, uh, even if the sea cables and so on uh, is at reduced capacity due to natural or not, not so natural disasters, uh, then uh, we will still be able to do what uh, people in Ukraine did, which is making sure that international friends concerned about uh, our situation can have a real-time feed of what's actually going on, and which is critical uh, because otherwise there's a appetite for information and if we do not provide real-time information then uh, of course disinformation uh, will take that uh, vacancy. Now, uh, we're not saying that we work with any specific uh, providers of non-geostationary uh, providers as long as they can provides uh, more bandwidth, lower latency, to enable this kind of uh, multi-party uh, real-time communication we're happy and open uh, to work with them. Uh, and I believe that local telcos uh, have uh, started um, exploring such partnerships uh, with international uh, providers, of non-geostationary providers. Uh, but at the moment, uh, because we have not yet uh, announced the commercial use uh, application, which is expected before the end of the year. So we have not, from the official part, uh, uh, engaged uh, with such providers. That would have to wait until the end of the year when the kind of open uh, process uh, of consultation and so on uh, concluded, and we have this room for opening for commercial applications. Of course, the 700 um, POC proof of concept is distinct. Uh, from the general available commercial application. So you may have you know, a few providers applying for commercial use, but we end up working with another vendor uh, for the 700 uh, proof of concept. So we're not saying that only one or only two uh, providers can provide such services. I'm going to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, I'm Nicholas Nugent from the United Kingdom, yeah. and I'm especially interested in the superconductor uh, semiconductor okay. industry. I want to ask two questions, if I may. The first one is, how much investment has the government made to support its semiconductor industry, given that we're hearing the United States, China, European Union are all moving in that direction? And if you don't have the figures to hand, is there a place we can find them? And secondly, if I may, I want to ask you about the President's statement that the Silicon Shield provides a degree of defense for mm -hmm. uh, Taiwan. It, it, um, can you explain that? And what about the contrary view that Taiwan's superiority mm -hmm. in semiconductors mm -hmm. risks aggravating your notional enemy of China even more? And that's a problem, particularly now that the United States is imposing sanctions. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, that's two big questions, mm -hmm. but uh, they're very interesting, I think, to all of us, mm -hmm. sure. if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, uh, so, of course, uh, from the MODA's uh, point of view, uh, because we're the, the software and data uh, ministry, uh, it's not directly within our purview uh, to invest in semiconductor, which is uh, under Ministry of Economic Affairs. But there are overlaps. For example, because we are in charge of cybersecurity, uh, related businesses. Uh, we work with, uh, for example, the SEMI, uh, Cybersecurity uh, Task Force, 
the FAPA Equipment Information Security Task Force and so on uh, to establish the SEMA E187 uh, standard to secure the uh, supply chain cybersecurity so that we can build um, trustworthy not just the chips themselves, but also the entire supply chain and so on. So uh, I, I believe uh, your question is better directed uh, to the SEMI and the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, but from the cybersecurity point of view, uh, we very much appreciate the fact that the international community, regardless of their jurisdictional economy, uh, trust Taiwanese chips. And, and we uh, treat this uh, trustworthiness uh, with uh, a lot of care. Uh, we want to also offer uh, cyber security services, uh, internet related services and so on, enjoying uh, the same degree of trustworthiness as our chips are, which is why our information cyber security vendors uh, are working closely with uh, SEMA and other semiconductor related vendors so that if they think uh, that uh, our cyber security information uh, vendors uh, is part of their trustworthy uh, supply chain, it lends credibility uh, to our software industry. Uh, I understand this doesn't completely answer your question, uh, but that is uh, better answered by the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Hi, and the silicon, the silicon shield question. Yeah, so uh, I think the the silicon shield, uh, as as you put it, um, we, we in Moda uh, we don't quite think in terms of whether our actions aggravates uh, a player uh, or or not. Um, we we see our partners as not. Uh, geopolitically or geographically close or far. Uh, we don't think in geo terms. Uh, we think in, in value terms, like we're natural partners uh, with any jurisdiction that is based on the idea of digital resilience for all, right? Uh, of democratic participation in internet governance, of uh, data free flow with trust, of respecting uh, the human rights and interoperability to enable human rights on the internet and so on. So if any jurisdiction, any economy is in line with such, then we form natural partnerships. Uh, you can call it shields if you want, uh, on cyber security, on collaborative defense, joint defense, and so on. Uh, and conversely, even in more authoritarian jurisdictions uh, where their regime uh, may uh, find it aggravating, uh, we still find um, people who are willing to work. Uh, for example, journalists uh, who want to practice journalism uh, free from censorship, from tempering, and so on, uh, are naturally um, friends, allies, uh, to the technologists that develop civic technologies, that use the latest in cryptography uh, to protect journalism, uh, to make sure that it can still survive and even thrive in more authoritarian uh, environments. And they are also our natural partners, uh, despite the fact that they may be in more authoritarian jurisdictions. So uh, we think of international partnership not just from a country to country perspective, but rather a uh, value perspective to have a democratic uh, network. So, which is why uh, our department of democracy network uh, is called such. Uh, in other ministries, it's called uh, Department of International Collaboration, or International Cooperation, or International and Cross Strait Cooperation, and so on. But uh, in MODA, because we care about the democracy network, our department for international engagement is just called the Department for Democratic. Network, democracy network. Thank you. Uh, yes. Perhaps connecting to that, um, yes. the, the EU is often boasting that its privacy legislation is the best in the world and that it exports that beyond its borders. Uh, was EU legislation an inspiration for MODA? And if, if not, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any criticisms or you know, uh -huh. points? Yeah, uh, I think this is uh, a very good question. Uh, indeed, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, recently ruled. Uh, that we need, uh, a, in a country level, build independent data protection mechanisms. And I believe the GDPR uh, way of thinking about things is a direct inspiration uh, to the constitutional court ruling. Um, we are broadly uh, inspired by EU in our Privacy Act already. Uh, the main difference being uh, our min each ministry is in charge of its own uh, business's uh, personal data protection. So instead of an independent DPA, uh, we have a dozen or so ministries, each acting as data protection officers uh, to their uh, trades in the uh, private sector. But uh, having an independent mechanism, I think, increases transparency and accountability. Uh, and to prepare uh, towards GDPR compliance, uh, including the independent mechanism, in the next couple of years, the model will invest heavily 
uh, in privacy enhancing technologies or PETS. Uh, because nowadays, the latest advances in the PETS allows people uh, to uh, derive like machine training models and so on. Uh, that is as good as if you have access to raw data without any sacrifice uh, in the privacy. Uh, but that requires a lot of computation uh, to deploy such so-called uh, zero-knowledge uh, proof systems or federated learning, differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, and so on. <clears throat> to translate these, uh, frankly speaking, very avant-garde uh, concepts into something that people can not just understand, but also voluntarily participate in, uh, we also take a EU idea, which is called data altruism, uh, meaning that if people want to voluntarily contribute to the public good, uh, undergoing the kind of uh, data anonymization or other privacy enhancing technologies voluntarily, then they are the kind of pilots uh, to engage with these new kinds of data sharing uh, with trust. So we're not mandating uh, like everyone in Taiwan to engage in a data altruism, but Taiwanese people do have a very strong tendency to voluntarily engage uh, in public good and charitable causes. Uh, and one example in early 2020, uh, through the National Health Insurance Experts app, uh, we donated more than 7 million pieces of mask by people voluntarily not collecting their ration mask quota and telling the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, these are earmarked for international humanitarian aid. So we send those 7 million pieces very early on. And that is the kind of altruism, right? So uh, I believe we will continue to work with uh, all the other ministries to prepare ourselves uh, through the PETS for the day, uh, maybe a couple of years from now, that we have a EU compatible independent data protection mechanism. Okay, I think it's. Yeah. I don't think society is really open to new technologies. Mm -hmm. Do you have an explanation why? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's because we're a very young uh, democracy. We're so young that uh, we see democracy itself as a form of technology. It is like a social technology, right? Instead of hundreds of years of traditions, uh, when we first started the presidential election, uh, direct election in 1996, already there is wild web. So it's very natural for the designer of the democratic process to think beyond the ballot box, which was, of course, constrained by the physics, uh, right? So instead of just you know, a few bits uploaded every four years, which is voting still very important, uh, with all due respect, uh, we invest more time in continuous uh, democracy, including uh, participatory budgeting, uh, which is practiced a lot on the municipal level. Uh, national level, we have a very vibrant e-petition, even people under 18, if they collect more than 5,000 electronic signatures, they can demand a minister level response, even an interagency level meeting. Uh, with the very young participants. Uh, it's very popular with people around 17 years old and 70 years old. So these two uh, age brackets, they, I guess, have more free time uh, and also care about uh, the long-term sustainability. So we get very creative uh, petitions like banning the plastic straws from the national drink bottle tea uh, and so on. So uh, I think this kind of continuous democracy makes it possible for us to try a new idea for 60 days uh, and see if it works or not. Uh, and the kind of uh, dynamic in other uh, democratic countries that will require four years or at least yearly uh, review in Taiwan is usually just 60 days before we have the next iteration the presidential hackathon is designed to surface the best local ideas in the past year uh, to the national level uh, by way of what we call quadratic voting. It's a new voting method. Again, it's an innovation on the democratic process itself. So by saying that democracy is a kind of social technology like semiconductor that, that iterates uh, from generation to generation, uh, we increase the bandwidth of collective decision making and we reduce the latency to build collaboration across that. So if you to answer your question. Yes, I, I think, sorry, yeah. Hi, so uh, the network tells you in Taiwan, there were several cyber attacks on the uh, government website, including the one for national defense. Do you have any comments regarding it? Because there were rumors saying that, that cyber attacks would come from uh, management. Uh -huh. Uh, during that time, I think the denial of service attack uh, was 30, uh, 23, 23 times the previous peak. Uh, so the DDoS 
I mean, from Taiwan, we can see that these attacks from uh, you know overseas uh, cables, right? So uh, obviously, it's not domestic. Uh, but how many hops uh, did it jump through? Uh, of course, it's difficult to do a full attribution. On the other hand, uh, I think this is helpful in a sense that uh, it really increased people's awareness that it's not just about confidentiality or integrity. Availability is also important. So the CIA uh, cybersecurity triad, usually people care more about not being uh, tempered with uh, the integrity of data, sensitivity data must not leak and so on, which is very important. But um, during that time, we have uh, seen that uh, there is a narrative going on, that kind of psych psychological operation uh, that confuses um, just a few hours of uh, BBOS taking down, like dialing uh, into a, a telephone line and keep dialing in it so you cannot accept new calls anymore. Uh, the narrative was confusing that with infiltration and even control of the entire line itself, like uh, the presidential office and the uh, national defense ministries has been taken over. Of course, it's not. It's just denial of service uh, taking the website down, but it did raise the awareness. And I think it was against this backdrop that we deployed a kind of humor over rumor uh, tactic, uh, which is the standard counter disinformation uh, in our playbook. Uh, so I publicly said, uh, thanks to the help from the interplanetary uh, file system uh, friends, uh, we uh, the MODAP website, which went uh, online the same time, the same hour as the so-called drill, uh, the military drill, uh, and we never suffered even one second of downtime because we partnered with the Global Content Delivery Network and we uh, work with the interplanetary uh, system, the Web3, to make sure that uh, our updates cannot be tampered with. So that very successfully changed the conversation so that people understand, oh, so taking down websites is not the same as infiltrating uh, a, a ministry and so on. So I think on the counter disinformation viewpoint, it gives people kind of vaccine of the mind. So the next time uh, such the US happens, uh, this kind of rumor will not spread as easily uh, as you uh, may have heard. Yes. The, uh, Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we heard this morning from the Mainland Affairs Council mm -hmm. the, the threat of cognitive war warfare that yeah. put it from China and you know, mm -hmm. spread of disinformation mm -hmm. over the internet. Is that something that your ministry mm -hmm. is dealing with? And if so, sort of what sort of strategies mm -hmm. are you looking mm -hmm. at? But this is uh, a cross-ministerial uh, effect, uh, and I think uh, each uh, each uh, competent authority, each ministry, uh, have teams of uh, what we call participation officers uh, to engage uh, with the citizenry, so that whenever any kind of disinformation happens, uh, because we have a lot of voluntary fact checkers, uh, people from the civil society organization, or even people in their middle school, uh, which teaches media competence, not just literacy, uh, they can dedicate their time uh, to the COFAX uh, civil society organization ecosystem, like the Wikipedia, but for the trending rumors, uh, but also the private sector players like Trend Micro and Google Look, which makes school scoring and so on. So we partner uh, with them so that when they detect that there's trending disinformation going on, uh, we see the basic reproduction number, right? On average, uh, how many people does it spread? And we identify the most viral uh, streams. It's a public dashboard. And if it falls to a certain ministry, for example, to, to MODA, uh, then in our website, we have a dedicated area for real-time clarification on friendly, uh, frequently asked questions. It's phrased in a very neutral way. <laughs> and so we will, uh, we will strive to respond within a couple of hours uh, with two pictures, if possible. Uh, within 200 characters, the triple two principle. And we strive to make our messages mimetically viral so that it reaches more people uh, than the original piece of disinformation through humor, through comedy, and so on. Uh, to this end, uh, we just posted, if you check my Facebook, uh, in my Flickr uh, account, uh, my photo of me doing all the popular mimetic uh, posts uh, like this, or like this, or like uh, whatever, right? So all the popular memes, uh, I, I do them all, uh, and I relinquish copyright so that our uh, friendly comedians uh, in the civil society can freely uh, remix such messages uh, so that people can laugh about it. And once they do laugh about it, it takes the kind of initial outrage away uh, from the disinformation. Yes? Uh, thanks. I know, we're, I know we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, just on a scale of one to 10, uh -huh. Uh, 10 being the most sophisticated, uh -huh. uh, 
where would you rate the sophistication of uh, uh, cyber attacks on uh, Taiwanese entities uh, by mainland China? Well, and then another question, I just wonder if you could offer your thoughts on uh, Russia's giving Edward Snowden citizenship. Uh -huh. And the, what, Russia, what, sir? Uh, Russia just gave Edward Snowden uh, uh -huh. the citizenship. Uh -huh. I, and I just, maybe it's too personal a question, but I, I imagine, I wonder what your thoughts on that are. Is Snowden a hero or a criminal? Uh -huh. yeah. I don't have immediate comments on okay. that. I just learned about this news. Oh, this is oh, oh, very okay. newsworthy. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so, but for the first question. Um, so, what we have seen uh, is a combination of cybersecurity, like DDoS, which is not very sophisticated, uh, but with disinformation or information manipulation, which could be quite sophisticated. So this is very hybrid, right? From, from a very uh, uh, simple DDoS operation, uh, there could be a very sophisticated narrative going on. Or from a very simple observation, like during the pandemic, uh, there was a time where they say disinformation uh, saying that the toilet papers will run out because the nation is confiscating it to make medical grade masks, which is demonstrably false. It's plastic and paper products. But still, some people believe that. And some people do uh, go to panic buy. But a photo of people going to panic buying were then amplified into quite sophisticated uh, messages saying democracy, you know, always lead to chaos and cannot get out of the pandemic and cannot even run an election property and, and things like that. So I, I wouldn't uh, very easily say this is on the point one or point three or point seven and so on, uh, because the, the point is not to demonstrate technical prowess, that the point is to decimate, like cut by 10% uh, people's trust in democratic process, in democratic society. So digital resilience for all uh, means that we anticipate such uh, attacks on all fronts, not just every security, but also psyops and so on, and making it clear that we're not taking anything down. We're not censoring things, taking sides down because of such attacks. Rather, we're taking a strategy of notice and public notice, uh, working closely with journalists and international fact checkers and educators and so on. We want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, oh, this is virus uh, variant uh, BA.5 or something of uh, this uh, tactic uh, and identify this tactic and so that people, when next time they receive such messages, they have this immune response saying, oh, it's the, this kind of operation again. And according to our National Academy's uh, studies, it's, it's working now. So more and more people, once they receive uh, some propaganda or hybrid uh, form of messaging, they automatically associate, oh, that's a manipulation, uh, even if it's factually true. But that's OK, because people do have the capability to fact, fact check. Uh, uh, All right, I think one last question. OK, yeah, sorry. Um, but did, did, did you ask a question before? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so very quickly. Um, very quickly. I don't really understand because um, when I left for Taiwan, I was called by my editor and said, "There's there's a rumor that Xi Jinping is being taken hostage, and there's a coup in China, and so on. Could you double check?" And there was huge panic, and I knew this had to be a rumor, but it apparently this spread in Taiwan. So what? what uh -huh. You know, this was not successfully contained or anything. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this in China? Mm -hmm. or can well, you interpret it? Uh, so uh, I, it, it's not. I have not received this particular form of virus. Uh, but maybe the the reason why is that, as I mentioned, COVAX and so on, it depends on people in end-to-end -end encrypted chat groups like Line, which is like WhatsApp, to identify. Um, so this information have a, a very specific definition. It's uh, intentional, it's harmful, uh, and it's untrue, right? So if people think uh, this intentional, harmful, and untrue, they flag uh, this information on the COFAX and other participating ecosystems. Now, if people do not flag it as much, uh, maybe that's because they don't consider it as harmful as other uh, virus strains, right? So it, it may be viral, but it, doesn't, it isn't particularly toxic, maybe. Uh, so, but it's difficult to 
uh, hypothesize on the negative, right? <laughs> if you uh, tell me that, oh, people are flagging this, this is trending on Colfax, I can interpret it for you. But if you're saying um, not many people are reporting it, it's, it's difficult to analyze why people don't report that. Sorry about that. So maybe one last question for sure. Hi, there. Uh, I would like to ask you when you uh, were what was the strategy of the country? Could you somehow divert uh, the communication? And what, what I guess from China you consider as the most brutal? And if you are coping with the possibility of effects on infrastructure, electricity and so on, the little country is very digital and it could be very harmful. Like in Ukraine, you know, it happened, but a lot, a lot of stuff are connected and not very uh, analogous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't fully uh, comprehend the that diverse parts you you said. Like you know, uh, like for example, our victim of the video that you can, for example, switch off some connections from abroad. For example, internet is also. Oh yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, that's one way, right? If the virus gets really bad, uh, sometimes people do have to impose lockdowns. On the other hand, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we've never imposed a lockdown uh, in the past two and a half years. Uh, because we had such experience in SARS, and we consider there could be uh, better responses through democratic resilience. There's just that people understanding uh, how the virus functions and take uh, necessary precautions uh, on a democratic uh, way. So similarly, uh, to counter a DDoS, it's also possible uh, to work with uh, any cast uh, internet providers uh, across the globe. Uh, so that even when they saturate uh, one particular data provider, uh, other CDN providers can take the load. Or, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, publish also on the Web3 um, IPFS and related Web3 systems, uh, the same uh, system that hosts the NFT uh, board uh, eight, uh, pictures. Uh, and so to, to take these down, it will cause a lot of economic collateral. Uh, so I, I think the point I'm making is that there are many ways uh, out uh, when you're uh, face, uh, facing a threat. The, if you don't understand the threat well or the virus well, the immediate intuitive uh, response is to do a lockdown, uh, is to say, oh, let's close off the you know, connections and so on. Uh, but as the resilience builds in the population, there's almost always uh, ways to work with international like-minded value close um, partners so that uh, we can defend in a joint fashion because there's existing backbones designed to do that in Ukraine. Uh, they didn't uh, operate many of their government services on the public cloud either uh, before the war. But because of the war, they have to invest in such capabilities to operate in a kind of non-data localization kind of way, while of course protecting cybersecurity and privacy and so on. So uh, I think uh, a lot of MODA's work is to also tell other ministries that there are ways through cybersecurity, uh, as I mentioned, PETS and other advanced uh, te techniques, we can distribute the computation uh, without infringing on the integrity and confidentiality of the data. And that is necessary if a large scale attack that is over the capacity of even the largest computation or storage providers in Taiwan domestically uh, would do. So, which is why, of course, the proof of concept with 700 uh, non geostationary orbit and so on uh, also includes three other overseas points uh, so that we can ensure that such communication can also uh, involve uh, democratically like minded partners so that they can also keep the communication uh, flowing. So I, I really have to run. <laughs> Sorry about that, and thank you for the great question. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you.